as per request, I'm going to work out the problem that we did in lab, which is a cart of mass M1 comes in with speed VI1. So here is a cart of mass M1 coming in with speed VI1. Now, it's very important to keep track of your subscripts on this. If you have a whole bunch of different Vs with different subscripts, they are not the same variable. And if you get sloppy about your subscripts, you can completely confuse yourself. So I'm going to try and be careful about that. And hits a second cart of mass M2 at rest. The collision between the two is elastic. So what that means is energy and momentum will be conserved. So here's cart M2. The collision is elastic. What is the final velocity of both cars? So this is before. I'm going to draw after over here. So cart M2 will go out at some velocity. And cart M1 after the collision will also go out at some velocity. So we will call this V1F and we will call this one V2F. Now you may already be saying, wait a minute, we remember from lab that this cart bounced back. And that was true. You had some weights on this cart and the incoming cart bounced back. So why are you drawing it that way? Why don't you draw it the other way? And here's the reason I'm doing that, is that I'm assuming I have my axes set up so that x is that way, and then there's no other relevant direction, so it doesn't matter, but I'll draw y that way. By drawing it this way, I can say that the final velocity of this guy is speed v1f in the x direction. And if I get a positive V1F, it means it's going that way. If I get a negative V1F, it means it's going that way. Now, I could have drawn it the other way. If I had drawn it the other way, I would have to say its X velocity was minus V1F. And then if I got a negative value for V1F, it would mean it's going this way. And that double negative could well confuse you. You can do it if you keep track of it. But if you do it this way, it'll be a little easier to keep track of. So I'm going to do it that way. So these are our um, initial and final pictures. It's an elastic collision, so what we have is both momentum and kinetic energy will be conserved. There's no potential energy changes because they're all staying at the same level. Nothing's going up or down. There's no potential energy changes, so there's no need to keep track of potential energy. Potential energy only matters if it changes. So that's the initial momentum, the initial, I'm going to use K, no, you know what, I'll use E for energy because it is kinetic energy, but I'll just use E because why not? And that should have been an M, and that should have been a VI1. See, I told you you had to be careful with subscripts, and already I screwed it up. So, bad me. M1 VI1 squared. That's good. And then PF is equal to M1 V1F plus M2 V2F. And really, this is PIX, and this is PFX. It is also the magnitude of the momentum, but you have to be really careful because magnitudes of momenta are always positive and you will never, almost never directly, never directly add the, mom the magnitude of momentums of different objects. When you're adding momentums of different objects, you have to do a vector sum. In this case, it happens to work out to the same thing, so if you're sloppy, you won't get hurt. But it's important to remember when you add momenta, you do a vector sum. So I'm adding the x components of the momentum here. The y and z components are both zero, so I don't have to worry about that. But here I'm adding the x components, so that's what comes out. And then EF is equal to one half m1 v1f squared plus one half m2 v2f squared. Okay, so that's our setup. Um, and now we have to think, all right, what can we equate to each other? Where well, I've already said it, PIX equals PFX, so we have M1V1I is equal to M1V1F plus M2V2F. And we have one half M1VI1 squared is equal to one half M1V1F squared plus one half M2V2F squared. Now, this is standard algebra. Maybe algebra 2, but it's standard high school algebra at this point. Look at this equation. What's known and what's unknown? So V1i is known. M1 and M2 are known. So V1i, M1, M2. V1f and V2f are unknown, and that is accounts for all the variables here. So I have two equations and two unknowns. It should be possible to solve for them as long as the equations are independent. Now, some of you 
And Viop tried to operate in the mode of, oh, I'll solve this for V1 F, and once I have that, I'll plug it back into here and get V2 F. Well, this equation is only one equation, so what you'll get out of that, if you do it right, is like V1 F equals V1 F at the end of the whole thing, and that won't be very helpful. It's also possible to have two equations that aren't independent. For instance, if I take this equation, I multiply the whole equation by two, it looks like a different equation, but really it's the same thing. These two really are independent, though. So it is possible to solve it. So now it's just a matter of doing the algebra. Now, there's two ways I can approach the algebra, and I'm going to do them both. Um, I'm going to start, I mean, the, bo in both ways, I'm going to start with this is the simpler one. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to solve it for one of the unknowns, and then I will substitute that into the second equation, and then the second equation will only have the other unknown. Now, so then the question is, do I find V1F or V2F first? So I'm going to start by finding V1F first. So if I want to find V1F first, that means I want to have this equation only in terms of V1F. I need to get rid of V2F. So I'm going to start by solving the momentum equation for V2F. So I have M2 V2F, and I'm going to subtract M1 V1F from both sides. So that's M1 V1I minus M1 V1F, or V2F is equal to m1 over m2 times v1i minus v1f. Notice I factored out an m1, and then I divided both sides by m2. Now that I know this, I can plug that into this equation. So I have 1 half. You know what? I'm going to multiply this whole equation by 2, then all the 1 halves go away. So having done that, I will have an m1 v1i squared is equal to m1 v1f squared. plus m2, and now this is important, it's v2f squared, so I have to have m1 over m2 times v1i minus v1f. That whole thing is inside, this is v2f here, from that, that whole thing is inside the squared. If you don't put the m1 over m2 in the squared, you're doing it wrong. So, okay, well, what next? Well, I need to try and simplify this. My goal, I only have one unknown, V1F, so my goal is to get all the V1Fs on one side of the equation. And I, well, I have that right now, but I've got mixture stuff. Ideally, I'd like V1F equals stuff. It turns out that won't be possible. But as much as possible, I want to try and isolate the V1Fs. So let's work on that. So well, the first thing to do is going to be to square this out. So let's do that. So M1, V1I squared, I've been sloppy already. I'm a terrible person. Um, I've mixed up V1i and VI1. Well, okay, we will cope with that. So V1i, VI1, I mean the same thing. I apologize for having mixed that up. But if you mix up your I's and your F's, or if you just change your name partway through, it's a complete disaster. Dogs and cats living together. So M1, V1F squared, plus M2, now, when you have the product of two things, in this case, that times this parentheses squared, you square each piece. So that's going to become times m1 squared over m2 squared. And then you'll see that this m2 cancels one of the m2s in the squares. And now I have this thing squared, and that's just a binomial. I know how to square that. It's going to come v1i squared, except why don't I be consistent within myself and call it v no, I am calling it V1i. V1i squared plus V1f squared. So I get the V1i squared when I multiply this by the first one of itself, that when I multiply by the last one of itself. Then I have the two cross terms. When I write these out, where I'll have that times that plus that times that. They will both give me a V1i, V1f negative. So I end up with minus two V1i, V1f. Well, okay, so what do I do with this? Well, here's the thing to notice. I have a V1F here and a V1F, sorry, V1F squared and a V1F squared. Okay, I want to get those together. But I still also have a V1F. And then I have a bunch of stuff that's not times anything V1F. When that happens, you, you can recognize, oh, this is going to be a quadratic. I'm, I can collect all the terms together so I have stuff times V1F squared plus stuff times V1F plus stuff and then I can use the quadratic formula. So let's try and do that. So first of all, what I'm going to do is take this right side and write it over on the left. So I'll subtract, in fact, here I'll do this in place. 
I will subtract m1 v1 i squared from both sides. Right, I've subtracted that from both sides, and now I can just start collecting stuff together. So what's multiplying v1 f squared? Well, there is an m1 plus, what's multiplying it here would have been an m1 squared over m2, over m2 times v1 f squared. So I've collected all the v1 f terms. What's multiplying, sorry, all the v1 f squared terms. What's multiplying v1f? Well, I have an m1 squared over m2 and a minus 2 v1i, so I have a minus 2 m1 squared over m2 v1i times v1f. And now I have to collect together all the terms that aren't multiplying any v1f at all. And I've got this term and this term, so that's plus m1 squared over m2 minus m1 times v1i squared. I fact out the v1i squared because there would have been one there and also one there. And this whole thing, I'll write it over here, is equal to zero. So now that we know that is equal to zero, we can use the quadratic formula. So I'm going to do that. So we know that v1f, and remember the way the quadratic formula works, I'll write it up here, is that if you have zero is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, then x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now before I do this, there's actually one other thing I want to do over here that'll make it a little bit nicer. I want to um, turn these things this one and this one into a single fraction. So what that means is I have to multiply this m1 by m2 over m2. Right, so I'll have an m2 m1 over m2. And now it's a common denominator. What I can say is, oh, it's a common denominator. So like it's 1 half plus 3 halves is 4 halves. So I can write it like that. By the same token, I'll have to multiply this m1 by m2. And so when I put them over the common denominator, I'll have m1 squared minus m1, m2, all over m2. And that'll just make it a little cleaner when I do this. So v1f, let's go back to my blue pen, is equal to negative b. So that is 2m1 squared over m2 times v1i. OK, that's negative b. Plus or minus the square root, and this is going to be long, of b squared, so b squared is 4 times m1 to the fourth over m2 squared times v1i squared minus 4ac, so minus 4 times a is m1 m2 plus m1 squared over m2, and c is m1 squared minus m1 m2 all over m2. And then there's also a v1i squared out here. I told you it was going to be long. Let's see if I can fit it v1i squared. I fit it. Hooray me. All over 2a. And then a is that. So all over 2 times m1 m2 plus m1 squared divided by m2. Okay, that's a little frightening. The first thing I'm going to do looking at this is notice I have a 2 in this term. If I also have a 4 in both of these, if I factored the 4 out, I would have 4 times a bunch of stuff. And then if I took the 4 out of the square root, the square root of 4 is 2, I would have a 2 in front here times this without that. So I would have had a 2 and a 2. I could have factored that out to a 2 in front of the whole thing just going to get rid of all these twos, which cancel these fours because they're under the square root. That'll just make life a little, just a wee, tiny bit nicer to me. Now here's another thing that happens is that whenever you have fractions of fractions, it's nice to kind of reduce it down to just fractions. So the, what I'm going to do is remember, if you have something in the denominator of the denominator, it's the same as if it were in the numerator, right? What I just said was, if I have a divided by b over c, I can multiply the top and the bottom both by C. These will cancel. I will get CA over B. I just lost some work because the camera 
has a one gigabyte file size limit on its chip. So now I have to go back and redo what I was doing. Rage! Okay, think about the kittens. Kittens, okay, good. I need to go to the next term. So, what was I doing? Yes, I wanted to put these things over a, um, I wanted to get rid of the fractions over fractions. So I'm gonna multiply the whole top by M2. And so that's gonna give me a V1F is equal to, so on the top I'll have, you know, multiply the first term by M2, multiply the second term by M2. So first term, M2 times M1 squared over M2. Hey, look, it's gonna cancel. Good, times the V1I, plus or minus, now I need to multiply this second term by m2, but what I'm gonna do is put it inside the square root, which means I have to make it m2 squared. So I have m2 squared times m1 to the fourth over m2 squared. Hey, look, it cancels, times v1i squared minus m2 squared times m1, m2 plus m1 squared over m2 times m1 squared minus m1 m2 over m2 times v1i squared. And in the second term, notice I have m2 squared, and the denominator I have m2 times m2, another way of saying that is m2 squared, so both of those will cancel that. Hey, that's nice, they all went away. And I still have the this in the denominator because I didn't do anything to get rid of it. Okay, that's good. Some stuff has gone away. It's a little bit nicer. It's still long. We can still simplify it more. Let's do that. So I have V1F is equal to M1 squared V1I. Now, I want you to notice another thing. Notice the first term, and this is whole thing is a second term, both of them have a V1I squared in it. So I'm going to factor that out inside the square root here. So I have a V1I squared that I factored out times m1 to the fourth, and now I have to multiply out this binomial, that plus that times that minus that. So let's do it, and notice it's minus, so let's deal with that. So the first one is m1 times m2 times m1 squared, and it's minus, so that's minus m1 cubed m2. Now I do the first one, I'm distributing this first term in, so it has to be m1 times m2 times minus m1 m2, but then there's another minus, so minus times minus is plus, so I get plus, m1 squared m2 squared. Now we have m1 squared times m1 squared, that's gonna be m1 to the fourth, but there's a minus. And then finally, m1 squared times minus m1 m2, but there's another minus, so it's plus m1 cubed m2. And now, oh, I still have to put the denominator in, so I will. m1 m2 plus m1 squared, Excellent. And now look at this. I have m1 to the fourth minus m1 to the fourth. I have m1 cubed m2 minus, well, minus and plus m1 cubed. So I'm just left with, I'll write it, I'll write it one more time, but v1f is equal to m1 squared v1i plus or minus the square root of v1i squared times m1 squared times m2 squared all over, I'm about to weep, 1, m2 plus m1 squared. And I know I've done something wrong because I'm not getting the answer I should get. I am, I'm getting the answer I should get. I, I apologize, I was thinking too hard. Good. Um, it's a square root of something squared. I'm gonna do this in place, brace yourself. If I have the square root of something squared, that is the same as the thing. And notice also, I now have a VI in both terms. So I'm gonna do this in place too. No, I won't do it in place. You probably hate me for that. So V1F, I will factor out the V1I times M1 squared plus or minus M1, M2 over, I'm gonna rearrange the plus because you can always do that, M1 squared plus M1, M2. Notice I have an M1 and an M1 and an M1 and an M1. There's always an M1 in every term. I can divide it out, so that goes away. That goes away. And now I am left with this, and I'm gonna write it a little more simply. M1 plus or minus M2 over M1 plus M2. All right, that's my answer for V1F. 
Now I'll have to find the V2F that goes with that, and I'll do that in a moment. I'm going to erase this over here. But I first want to think about what does this V1F mean because there are two answers, and which is the one that I care about? Well, actually I care about both of them. So let's just write them out separately. V oh, I erased what V2 was. Now I'll have to refigure that out. So V1F is equal to V1I times M1 plus M2 over M1 plus M2. So I just chose the plus is equal to V1I. All right. Or, so that's one of them. The other possibility is V1F is equal to V1I times M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2. Interesting. Now, I need to reconstruct my from my momentum equation. It was right over here just before I erased it like an idiot. So I had the thing that told me what V1F was in terms of, or sorry, what V2F was in terms of V1I. That was V2F is equal to M1 over M2 times V1I minus V1F. Right? So in this case, if V1F is equal to VI, in this case I get V2F is equal to zero. All right? That is one possible solution that will conserve momentum and kinetic energy. Let's think about what that means. V1I equals V1F and V2F equals zero. That means they didn't collide. Right? That means the end state is exactly the same as the initial state. That will certainly conserve momentum and energy because nothing changed. So this is the case, this is the solution for, oh, the collision, either the collision hasn't happened yet or they missed. It's certainly valid, it's just not interesting. So let's do this one. This one is much more interesting. So in this case, and now I know I'm gonna need more space for it, so I'll draw the line like that. In this case, V2F is equal to M1 over M2 times V1I minus V1I times M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2. And now when you see stuff like this, you should say, ah, maybe it'll simplify if I come a denominator. See, I can speak in tongues. Um, doesn't that mean I'm electable? Um, if you put it over a common denominator, so let's do that. V2F is equal to M1 over M2 times V1I, and to put it over a common denominator, I have to multiply V1I times M1 plus M2 over M1 minus M2. And then since I've put it over a common denominator, I can factor out the V1I and I'll have minus M1 plus M2. Right, notice it was minus that, then minus minus, that's why that became minus and plus. All right, so this here, I have M1 minus M1, and I have M2 plus M2. So that's equal to M1 over M2 times V1I times two, M2 over M1 minus M2. And then this M2 will cancel that M2, so I get V2F is equal to V1I times two M1 over M1 minus M2. Now this one is more interesting. So let's think about this. Um, Okay, I did a thing wrong. Notice my denominator is M1 plus M2. So that still should have been plus, that still should have been plus here. Blue pen, you are failing me. And that still should have been plus there. My blue pen is kind of drying out. I'm sad, I'm so sorry. Okay, so let's think about this. That's one part of the answer. This is the other part of the answer. All right, this says, and I'm gonna answer part B right here now. V1F is this. When V1F is negative, it means it bounced back. When is V1F negative? When M2 is bigger than M1. Because if I subtract something bigger from something smaller, I'll get a negative number. The denominator is always positive, V1I, just defined as positive because it's coming in in that direction. So the answer to part B here, I just did part A, here's the answer to part B. If M2 is greater than M1, and that was the case in lab, you had, this one was more massive. That's why it bounced back. If M2 is less than M1, this guy would have continued forward. And that should sort of make sense. Think about an SUV hitting a duck. Does the SUV bounce off? No. The SUV continues forward, even if the duck is actually a rubber ducky and it's an elastic collision and it bounces off. 
So um, it is possible for the incoming thing to continue forward. V2, notice, is always positive. You're not going to hit this, and it's, there's no way it's going to recoil back. Now, if you're playing pool and you're putting backspin and stuff on balls, it's a whole different ball of wax, but here they're just sliding along. So that's always forward. Right? So those are, this is your real solution right here, and that's what many of you came up with eventually in lab. Now, if you look at this and think, oh my god, you just did a board and a half of algebra, I could never do that. Don't think that. That is not a good thing to think. Because you can. It's long, but each step is fine. And this is not one of those cases where you say, okay, an question, answer. This is a like, question, okay, let's set it up. Momentum is conserved, energy is conserved. I have two equations and two unknowns. I should be able to solve it. Let's do the algebra and see if I can. And then be very careful each step of the algebra. I made a couple mistakes. You saw me do it. But you have to be very careful each step of the algebra. And if you're very careful each step of the algebra, you can get down to the end and get it right. You can do it. But it involves being able to you know seeing the mist, the mist shrouded bridge. And being accepting that there's probably another end over there. So let's start walking across this bridge. Take that first step expecting that you'll get to the other side. Now, if you get across and the bridge is broken and there's a chasm, turn around and come back. But you might be able to get all the way across the bridge. I over-metaphored that. Okay, now, I told you earlier there was actually an easier way to do the algebra. So I'm going to do that next. I told you that um, if you make a, made a slightly different choice early on, the algebra actually would not have been so bad. So I'm going to show you what that is. Now, you might ask, well, how do I know what, what to do? The answer is you don't really. It's kind of luck sometimes. Um, sometimes what I'll do is I'm doing stuff and it's getting horrible. I say, what if I did this this other way and it gets better? Well, whatever. You know, you can do the thing I just did. That's important to realize that you can do that. All of you can do that. Is it trivial? No. Things are not supposed to be trivial. Is it long? Eh, medium long. Do you have to be careful? Yes. But you can do it. None of it is like, that is so advanced and hard I can't do it. Right? We're not talking Riemann geometry and tensor calculus to do general relativity here talking high school level algebra. So what I did last time is I said, well, let's find V1F first. And so then I substitute, made, got V2F from this one and substituted here. Let's just do it the other way around. Let's find V2F first. And so if I want to find V2F first, I'm going to get V1F from this equation and substitute it down here. So if I do that, I will say V1F is equal to M1 V1I minus M2 V2F all divided by m1. Okay, I get that. Now I'm going to substitute that in here. As before, I'm going to multiply the whole thing by 2. So I have an m1 v1i squared is equal to m1. Now I substitute in the v1f squared. m1 v1i minus m2 v2f all over m1 whole thing squared plus 1 half m2 v2f squared. Now, as before, I'm going to need to square this out, so I'm going to do that. M1 V1I squared is equal to M1 over the denominator M1 squared. Oh, look, that's going to cancel. I'll do that in a minute. And then this binomial, so that was the denominator I pulled out and squared it. I have to square this binomial, so as before, I'm going to get an M1 squared V1I squared plus M2 squared V2F squared minus 2, M1, M2, V1I, V2F. Plus, oh, I shouldn't have had that one half because I multiplied the whole thing by 2. Plus M2, V2F squared. Okay. So continuing the algebra on up here, I'm going to distribute this through here. So I have a M1, V1I squared still on the left. If I distribute, knowing that this becomes 1 and that I have, should leave the 2 there. That becomes over squared. I'm going to just divide all of these terms by m1, all of these terms by m1. I get is equal to m1 v1i squared plus m2 squared over m1 v2f squared minus 2 m2 v1i v1f plus m2 v 2 f squared. Now, notice I have this on both sides, so I can subtract it out. I shall do that. I get 0 is equal to, and notice over here, oh, I can't notice anything yet. I'll just write it out and then we'll look. 
m2 squared over m1 times v2f squared minus 2m2v1i. I did something horribly wrong. This v2f here should have been a v2f here. It's just a copying error. v2f. Plus, I noticed that because I had gotten rid of all my v1fs, and yet here was one back. I'm like, oh no, it's like a zombie, it's come back. Plus m2v2f squared. They made a few little algebra errors, so redo. Okay, so let's look at all this and see why. I want a common denominator this whole thing, but let's see if we can simplify it a bit first. So I want to notice there's an m2 in every term, so I'm going to divide every term by m2. So this m2 squared, when I divide by m2, that just becomes m2. Here, when I divide 2m2, all that, by m2, the m2 just goes away. And when I divide m2, v2f squared by m2, that just goes away. That's a little nicer. Now, I divided everything by m2. I could also divide everything by v2f, because notice there's a v2f, at least one in every term. Here's the reason I'm not going to do that, is we're going to remember, well, okay, it's possible v2f could be zero. And when you, if you divide by zero, things could happen. Now, I could say, okay, I'll work it out, and if v2f doesn't come out to zero, then I'll feel comfortable but you'll actually end up losing a little bit of information if you do that. So I'm not going to divide by V2F, but I'm going to factor it out. Now with M2, we knew it wasn't zero. We know M2 is positive, so dividing by that, no problem. So I'm going to factor out a V2F, and I have V2F times M2 over M1 V2F minus 2 V1I plus V2F. That starts to look kind of nice. So let's put all these over a common denominator. So we have a simpler fraction. So we have m2v2f minus 2m1v1i plus m1v2f all over m1. And now I'm going to multiply both sides by m1, and I'm going to collect some things inside here. Again, multiply both sides by m1. The 0 stays in m1. I have 0 is equal to v2f times I have an m2 plus m1 v2f minus 2 m1 v1i. All right, v2f times this has to be 0. There are two ways to satisfy that. One is if v2f is itself 0. And this is why I didn't want to divide earlier, because I would have lost this solution. This is actually a solution. v2f equals 0 is a way to solve this. That's one solution. or the thing inside the parentheses has to be 0. m2 plus m1 v2f is equal to 2m1 v1i. That will, if this is equal to that, that makes the difference 0. That gives me v2f is equal to 2m1 over m1 plus m2 v1i, which you may recognize as the answer that we had before. So. These are the two possibilities for V2F. And you'll notice the algebra, I didn't have to use the quadratic formula here. The algebra was a little bit simpler this way. But you should be able to do it either way. And then you do the same thing of figuring out V1F is, what V1F is from each of these. And either way, you get the right answer. So that is me working out the thing that I gave you in lab. OK, so whichever way I do the algebra, I end up with these solutions. And now in part C, I want to say what happens when m2 is a whole lot bigger than m1. And another way of saying that is when m1 divided by m2 is a whole lot less than 1. Right? I take something, I divide it by something else with the same units, I get something unitless. If they were equal, I would get 1, but m1 is much smaller, so that quotient is a whole lot less than 1. So what I want to do is try and manipulate these so that I can get stuff that has an m1 over m2 in it. So I'm going to start with this one. V1F, and to get M1 over M2, I'm just going to divide both the numerator and the denominator by M2. So I'm going to have fractions of fractions, but it'll be okay. We'll see where we're going with this. So if M1 over M2 minus M2 over M2 is 1, divided by M1 over M2 plus 1, all times V1i. And now here's the key. I have something dinky, right? Here's another way of saying this. m1 over m2 is approximately equal to 0. So I have something approximately equal to 0 minus 1. And I have something approximately equal to 0 plus 1. This is basically minus 1 and plus 1. So v1f is approximately v1i. 
Interesting. So that says if M2 is huge, in an elastic collision, this guy comes in and bounces off at the same speed. You may realize we've assumed that in a few of the problems we've done earlier of things bouncing off walls. This is why we could assume that. And then if you look at this one, V2F, and I'm going to do the same thing of dividing the numerator and the denominator by M2 to get things in this form. So I get that plus 1 times V1I. And as before, this is approximately 0. So I have 2 M1 over M2 divided by 1. That's approximately 2 M1 over M2 times V1I, which 2 times dinky is still dinky, is a lot less than V1I. So V2F is a lot less than V1I. The magnitude of this is also a lot less than V1F. So if this is a big, 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 big thing, and this comes, all right, SUV, rubber ducky, you bounce a rubber ducky off of your SUV, even if you don't have the parking brake on, the rubber ducky bounces back at the same speed it came in, and the SUV basically doesn't roll. A wee bit, but it's tiny. So these are the cases, and this is something we're going to use. We've already used it in some homework problems I've given you. Um, we're going to use the fact that if something little bounces off something big, it bounces off at basically the same speed if it's an elastic collision. And that is the end of problem one. Problem two. A bicycle wheel has most of its mass around its whim. Not whim, rim. Whim is like, hey, let's do a problem about bicycle wheels. So we're going to approximate a bicycle wheel as a ring. And why is that important? Because the moment of inertia of a ring is mr squared, right? Where that is r. And mass is the mass of all the stuff around the ring. So we're assuming that there's basically no mass at the axle. Eh. Not the greatest assumption, but let's assume it for the purposes of this problem, and that the spokes have basically no mass. So that's the moment of inertia of it. Consider such a wheel rolling without sloping down a slope of theta, right, because that's what things do. Things roll down slopes. So a slope of theta, where theta is equal to 20 degrees. And I've got this guy, and he's going to start at rest, and then he's going to object because he's not really round. No, he's round. And he's going to roll down the slope. The wheel starts at rest, has a mass of 1.6 kilograms and a diameter, no, a radius of 36 centimeters, which I'm going to write as 0.36 meters. Part A, by considering forces and torques, right, we're not even doing energy conservation right here, figure out the speed of the wheel after it has traveled through a distance of 2.5 meters. Let us draw ourselves a free body diagram. Let us define x is downhill and y is perpendicular to the to the the ground, right? The sloped ground. All right. The center of mass of the wheel. There's nothing there because it's just a ring. But the center of mass is still here. Is that way? So we have the force of gravity that way. The normal force here is where the wheel contacts the ground. So the normal force is that way, and then the wheel's going to roll this way. There will be a friction force this way. But this is a static friction force because it's rolling without slipping, which means it's not actually sliding. Like, slipping would be sliding. So only if you're slipping, which like when you slam on the brakes and you hear the Arr! or if you peel out and you hear the Arr! that's when you're sliding because your wheels are actually sliding along the ground and you leave some rubber on the road. And, you know, it's not optimum. So here there's a static friction. And those are all the forces that are acting on it. So now we do this standard old thing. Let's figure out the acceleration. What am I actually thinking about? Uh, what's its speed after it has gone 2.5 meters? Well, all right, so we want x and y, so let's start by breaking, um, breaking gravity into components. Now, this is the same angle theta because that is perpendicular to that and that is perpendicular to that. Here's your right triangle. So in the x direction, we know that the mass of the wheel times ax is going to equal opposite over hypotenuse sine, so mg sine theta minus f sub sf. And then in the y direction, it's not um, accelerating in the y direction. It's not moving at all in the y direction, which is perpendicular to the slope. It's staying right on the ground. So we know that may has to be 0. So by f equals ma, that's equal to fn minus mg cosine theta. So now we know that Fn is equal to mg cosine theta. Now here is a mistake 
you will be tempted to do is say, okay, now I know FSF is equal to F is equal to mu sub S F N, and this is wrong. That works for kinetic friction, does not work for static friction. The equation for static friction is SFF has to be less than mu sub F, mu sub S F N. And less than and equals do not mean the same thing. So if you substitute this in, you have done it wrong. How big is FSF? As big as it needs to be. How big does it need to be? I don't know. As long as it doesn't need to be bigger than this, it can be anything from zero all the way up to this. So I can't actually solve this because I don't know FSF and I can't substitute this in even though I do know FN. Turns out knowing FN would only help me if I want to decide if SFS is trying to be too big. So what can I do? Well, the problem actually tells me what to do. It says also consider torques. Well, let's do torques around the center of the wheel. Because if we do torques around the center of the wheel, there's zero lever arm for gravity, so gravity gives you no torque. For F sub n, the normal force, the lever arm is from here to here, right? We call that R sub n, and its length is just R. But notice that it's anti-parallel to F sub n, and when you take the cross product of two vectors that are either parallel or anti-parallel, you get zero. So there's no net torque. So the only torque we're going to have is going to be this torque, R sub n is also the torque for S, F sub SF, is going to be, and notice this radius is in the minus y direction, so minus R y hat cross F sub F SF, whatever it is, which is in the minus x hat direction, right? So that net torque, I have a minus R times minus F SF, is R F SF times y hat cross x hat, that's equal to R F S F in the minus Z hat direction because Y hat cross X hat is minus Z. And I should mention, if that's X and that's Y to have a right-handed coordinate system, X, Y, Z is out of the board. So this is into the board. Well, let's think about that. A torque into the board will get the thing rotating into the board that way, which is what you expect for a wheel rolling down the slope. We also know that the torque, and I'm gonna just say the magnitude of the torque, and then we'll say that alpha is into the board, so I'm doing torques in the negative z direction, has to equal the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. Okay, but what do I do with that? Well, here's the thing. Remember that um, if you're talking relative to the center of an object, if this point right here is accelerating, if this edge point is accelerating at A, and that's, sorry, R, then the angular acceleration of the object is equal to A over R. But in this case, we have this point not moving at all, right? It's still relative to the ground because it's not slipping, and this point accelerating at A. But if we slip into the momentary rest frame of the wheel, if this point is accelerating that way relative to this point, it's the same as that point accelerating that way relative to this point. So what I'm saying is, is that relative to the center of mass, the acceleration of this and the whole ground is A that way. So that means that this alpha has to be I times A over R, and I is M R squared times A over R. So this has to equal M R A. And now I can use that because now I have two equations and two unknowns. I have M R A is equal to RFSF minus RF, well, RSFSF, because both of these are in the negative z direction. Um, all right, this is the magnitudes we're talking here now, because we're just saying it's all in the negative z direction. FSF is unknown, also AX is unknown. So that's pretty cool. So what I have is R times FSF has to equal um, RFSF has to equal, I'm feeling distress at the moment, um, MRA, and I'm getting FSF is equal to MA, and I know that can't be right, because then gravity would be zero. So I've done something horribly, horribly wrong somewhere. What is that? I have not done anything wrong. 
I have done things wrong. I have not done anything wrong. No, I haven't done anything wrong. It's fine. FSF is MA. I still don't know FSF. So right, FSF equals MA. So I can plug that back in over here. I know that M, I'm just going to say A because we know the acceleration is all in the x direction, so the magnitude of the acceleration is also ax in the plus x direction. Ma has to equal mg sine theta minus ma, or 2ma is equal to mg sine theta, or when all is said and done, a is equal to g over 2 sine theta. Notice it's accelerating half as fast as it would if it were sliding. But that's because we have another force that's backwards. We have a frictional force that way that offsets it. And so A ends up being G over 2 sine theta. That's also what FSF will end up being then, because we'll put an N in there. All right. So now we have the acceleration. So what I'm going to do is, knowing this, I'm going to have to erase a bunch of the board. We have figured out that A, X, is equal to G over 2 sine theta. I now want to figure out how fast is it going after it has traveled 2.5 meters? So let's do that. I erased my axes. That was a mistake. Okay. So what we're going to use is, how fast is it going? Well, V in the x direction is equal to V 0x plus AXT. Yay! Oh, what's T? I don't know. So we're going to use that x is equal to x0 plus V0x plus one half a x t squared. So we're going to define, well here, let's do it like this. x minus x zero is equal to, uh, this should have been v zero x times t. I apologize for leaving that out. Okay, v zero x times t, but v zero x is zero is equal to one half a x t squared, or this tells us that t is equal to the square root of two times x minus x0 over a sub x. And then that's equal to the square root of 2 times x minus x0 over g over 2 sine theta is equal to the square root of 4 times x minus x0 all over g sine theta, yay. So now I know that, and x minus x0 we know because that's the, how far does it go? 2.5 meters. Good. Um, so now that we have this, uh, we can put that in over here, and we get that its speed, the x is zero, x is zero again, is equal to g over two sine theta times the square root of four times x minus x naught all over g sine theta. And I'm gonna simplify this a bit. I'm gonna put the g sine theta into the square root uh, and I'm going to put the 2 into the square, I'm going to put the whole thing into the square root, so it becomes g squared sine squared theta times x minus x naught, right? To put it in the square root, I have to square it. And there was a 4 on the top, 2 squared, I have to square it, I get 4, hey look, 4 divided by 4 is 0, times g sine theta, or I get the square root of g sine theta times x minus x naught, and I'm done, I can put the numbers in, I will do that, 9.8 meters per second squared, times the sine of 20 degrees times 2.5 meters is x minus x naught. Stick that into my calculator, and I get 2.895 meters per second, but I really only have two sig figs, so the answer would be 2.9 meters per second is what the x is after it's gone 2.5 meters down. So we have this little wheel rolling down, it's gone two meters, it's going 2.9 meters per second. That's part A. Part B, calculate the initial and final energies. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw this bigger. I'm going to leave this VX. I'm going to erase the rest of this because we don't actually need it. We don't even need the free body diagram. We will again in part C. I'll draw it again when the time comes. So the initial and final energies, here's the wheel here. It's going to be 2.5 meters lower. So what that says is that this distance here, we'll call that D, is equal to 2.5 meters. And then this angle is theta, which is 20 degrees. 
And also when it's down here, it is moving with speed v is equal to, um, well, I'll just call it v. I have the number down there. So the initial energy, and now what I want to, I'm going to define h equals zero is right here. So at, at its final point, it has no potential energy, just for simplicity. So its initial energy is equal to its initial kinetic plus its initial potential is equal to zero plus its mass times g times this height, which is, um, that's the opposite over adjacent times d sine theta. All right, and I know those numbers because they have mass is 1.6 kilograms, and I know the g is 9.8 meters per second squared, and I know d is 2.5 meters times sine 20 degrees. So when I calculate the initial energy, I get 13.407 joules. So that would be 13 joules to two sig figs, but I want to keep the extras. And then the final is EFK plus EFP. We chose H equals zero to be where it ends up, so it has no final. EFK is one half MV squared plus one half I omega squared. And now we have to do the same thing we thought about before. So the potential is zero. Remember, this point of the wheel is at rest with respect to the ground because it's not sliding. This point of the wheel is moving at speed V. Well, around the center of mass, this point, in the center of masses frame, this point is moving that way at V relative to the center of mass, right? It's just the relative velocity is all that it matters. So if the edge is moving at V relative to the center of mass, that just says omega has to be equal to V over R. So I can put that in. That's equal to 1 half MV squared plus 1 half, and then MR squared is I, we have that, times M over R, not M over R, V over R squared. Notice r squared over r squared, they go away, is equal to mv squared is the final energy because I have 1 half mv squared plus 1 half mv squared. So I can put those numbers in. m is 1.6 kilograms. And notice I could actually have done this whole thing symbolically. I had my expression for vx. I could have put that in. Guess what I would have gotten? Okay, 1.6 kilograms times 2. Point I erased my extra digits. I think I still have them here. 2.8947, yes. 8947 meters per second squared. Stick that in, and guess what I get? 13.407 joules. Hey, hey, look, energy is conserved in this system. And that might bother you, because part C, are there any external forces acting on the wheel which we are not tracking with potential energy? So to answer this, so we know that the first, the initial and final energies are the same. I'm just going to draw my free body diagram. All right? So we have gravity. That is an external force, but we're using gravitational potential energy, so we're tracking that. We have the normal force, that's an external force. And we have static friction, that's an, an external force. This force is perpendicular to the displacement that the wheel goes through at any time, right? The wheel is going this way down the plane. The normal force is perpendicular to the plane because these are perpendicular. That tells us everywhere along Fn dot delta r is equal to zero. So the normal force does no work. If the normal force does no work, then it won't change the energy of the system. But here's the rub. It's not perpendicular to delta r. It looks like, because delta r is that way and FSF is that way, it looks like static friction should be doing negative work, right? When you dot product two opposite vectors, you get a negative number. So the final energy should have been less than the original energy, but it wasn't. What went wrong? And here is the subtlety. I'm going to refer back to this here. Remember, I kept saying that if you look at this point right here, Right, if let's really zoom in on it, there's the ground, and here's the bottom of the wheel. This point right here is not sliding. And what really matters when you think about work is the point where the force connects. How much does that point move? And because it's not moving, it doesn't actually do work. 
right? The delta r relevant for SFS is not the delta r of the whole object, but the delta r of the contact point. And the delta r of the contact point here is always zero because it's rolling without slipping. It never slides. And so that's why static friction does no work. By the same token, if I had a wheel that was fixed in place and I started spinning it, and it was spinning relative to the ground, but I was holding the wheel in place, you know what happens. You, you squeal and you get kinetic friction because the wheel is rotating relative to the ground. That kinetic friction does do work because the contact point is moving, right? The wheel is moving that way relative to the ground. It's moving relative to where the force is being exerted. So that would have done work with kinetic friction. But here with static friction, it actually does no work because the delta R is zero. And that's what you always have to think about is what, how is the contact point of the force moving? So that is the second problem. All right, in the third problem, we have a marble rolling inside a spherical bowl. So there's our spherical bowl. It's really in 3D here. And there's a little marble inside rolling. So I'm going to define some variables here. I'm going to define capital R as the radius of the spherical bowl. I'm going to define lowercase r as the radius of the marble. The marble has diameter 2r is equal to 1.9 centimeters, which tells me that r is equal to if I was good, I could do this in my head. 0.95 centimeters is equal to 0 0.0095 meters is equal to 9.5 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. Okay, I wrote that a lot. Good. The mass of the marble is unknown. <laughs> and the inner diameter um, of the bowl, remember diameter is 2R is 0.5 meters, so capital R is equal to 0.25 meters. Okay, good. So we've got all that set up. As measured from the center of the sphere described by the bowl, right? So the bowl, it's a spherical thing. I could describe this whole sphere. I sort of cut off the top. But if I had the whole sphere, this is where the center would be. We also call that sort of the center of curvature. Um, the marble starts at a point that is 35 degrees away from straight down. So what we're saying is this theta here, where it starts, is equal to 35 degrees, and the marble starts at rest. And now the question is, if the marble rolls without slipping, what does that tell us? If it rolls without slipping, there will be no work done by friction because of everything we just said in the last problem. Right? The contact point will not be moving relative to the bowl. So even though there is friction, it's static friction. It's rolling without friction, and there is no relative motion of the contact point, so no work is done by friction. How fast is the marble going when it passes through the bottom point? So we want to find that V. And we can do this with conservation of energy. Now, you might think, oh, I can do this with forces, and I figure out, uh, here's the ball, and here's FG, and there's FN, and we have FSF, and we can do it just like we did with the bicycle wheel, and do angles and stuff, but what's hard about that is, as the marble rolls. FSF is always in a different direction. Fn is always in a different direction. Um, gravity is always down, but the direction it's accelerating is always changing. Oh my goodness, we don't have a constant acceleration. This will be hard. So let's just not do it. You could, but probably not with the stuff we've learned in this class. But energy is fine. We've already said there's no external forces doing work. Right? The normal force always does stay perpendicular to the direction of motion, wherever it is. Spherical ball, right? That matters. So it's always, well, of course, it's also just the contact of the, the contact point is always going to be perpendicular to the plane for a little spherical marble. So let's figure out what's the initial energy. And to figure that out, let's define h equals zero to be the bottom of the bowl. What is this height? Well, that's probably hard to figure out. It's not that hard to figure out. But we can do it. What is this height? Well. We can figure out this, right? Because this is r, and so that's going to be r cosine theta there. Notice also that this, all the way from here to here, is also r, right? So let's call, we'll say, this is the h we want. That whole thing is r. And then this thing here, we know, because this is also r, 
Adjacent over hypotenuse is cosine theta, so this thing is r cosine theta. So we know that this plus this, right, that's the same as that, h plus r cosine theta has to equal r, right, from the bottom up to there is r. So we know that h is equal to r times 1 minus cosine theta. And so now that we know that, I can say ei is equal to ef, which is eki plus epi is equal to ekf plus epf. Eki is 0 because it starts at rest. Epi is equal to m times g times r times 1 minus cosine theta. And then ekf, we have both translational and rotational. It's 1 half mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared, and then epf is 0. So let's think again. If you look at the marble, if the marble is moving with speed v that way, the ground is not moving. That's the same as this point moving that way at v relative to the center of mass. So it is the edge here. So um, omega is going to equal v over little r. So why do you keep doing this? I think it's always v over r. Yeah, but you've got to choose the right r. So I'm always thinking to make sure I get the right thing. And then finally, it's a sphere, so I know i is equal to 2 fifths m times little r squared. Make sure you use the right r. And this is the moment of inertia of the sphere. So that's equal to 1 half m v squared plus 1 half times 2 fifths m r squared for i. And then omega is v squared over r squared. Omega squared is v squared over r squared. The r squareds cancel. The twos cancel. I have a 1 half plus 1 fifth. 1 half is 5 tenths. 1 fifth is 2 tenths. 5 plus 2 is 7. That's 7 tenths mv squared is equal to mgr. And we're basically done at this point. Wee bit more algebra. I didn't tell you m. Doesn't matter. It divides out. So for the final answer, I've not managed the board in the best way possible, so I'm just going to write it up here. Multiply both sides by 10 sevenths. 10 sevenths times g times r times 1 minus cosine theta is equal to v squared. So put the whole thing under a square root, and I get v. And I can calculate this because I gave you numbers. So and notice little r didn't matter. That's kind of interesting. So that's 10 sevenths times 9.8 meters per second squared times big R is 0.25 meters times 1 minus cosine, I forgot my 1, 35 degrees, all under a square root. Put that in my calculator. When I put it in my calculator, I get 0 0.796 meters per second, or to the right number of sig figs, 0, V is equal to 0 0.80 meters per second. And that is the third problem. In fact, that is the last problem for this week. Have fun.